Imagine for a moment that all of this isn't real. Imagine for a moment that we are all a function of a computer algorithm. Real clever software running on high-end hardware to create this. You, the environment, the people sat next to you could all not be real. This isn't a new idea, nor is it my idea. It's been around for ages. This chap, is much cleverer than I, a chap called Nick Bostrom. He's an Oxford-based philosopher, and his contention is that more likely than not, we are all living in one giant simulation. So bear with me, I hope you've had coffee. He suggests that one of these three things has to be true. The first is that maybe we'll go extinct before we get to post-human. Post-human meaning we have sufficient technology and resources to be able to create simulations that will be required to create something just like this. Probably not very likely. The second is that we could actually get to post-human and we could decide, do you know, we've got all this technology, we're not going to use it for simulations, we're just not that bothered. Probably unlikely too. Which brings him to his conclusion that actually this is more than likely a simulation. How weird is that? This makes us feel uncomfortable. Just kind of weird. It feels uncanny. It's entirely possible then that we're all puppets. And actually none of this matters. I'm not stood on this stage. You're not sat in the audience. But it does feel kind of freaky. Which makes it unusual for me to think, if it makes us feel freaky, why are we spending so much time investing and researching virtual reality? If it makes us feel awkward, why are we doing it? And we are doing it. We're doing tons and tons and tons of it. In fact, in the next nine years, we're going to have spent over $100 billion on researching and developing VR. That's a lot of dollars. And what are we doing with these dollars? Well, we're developing hardware, we're developing software, we're building environments, we're putting on headsets, and we're creating something. We're creating a reality which feels almost real. But it's almost real. It's not quite there yet. And what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. Hello, I'm Siren, and I'm a digital human. I was created by an international team of artists and engineers who wanted to challenge our ideas of what a synthetic human could be. So this is my work. It's great work. It's a function of the Unreal Engine. But look at that. They've taken time to create skin imperfections. They've taken time to make sure that the parting's just not quite right. The software is using algorithms to create irregularity to try and suggest that this is a real thing, not a humanoid, that it's not synthetic. But it still makes us feel weird because it's not quite right. In fact, there's a term for this. It's called crossing the uncanny valley. We know this isn't real. It makes us feel awkward. It is uncanny. And the holy grail is to cross the uncanny valley. What's interesting for me is this concept's been around for ages. The phrase uncanny valley was first invented in 1973. So we've been thinking about this for a long time. Sure, our tech is getting better. Our hardware and software is better than ever before. And yet still, we've not crossed this uncanny valley. So this is a shot I took when we were at Mobile World Congress a couple of years ago. Samsung, keen to promote their virtual reality headsets, uh, invited Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook to come and talk about the power of VR. I love this shot. Look at it, everyone in their own isolated virtual world. I like the guy that's mildly confused and has lifted his headset off, but best of all, I like the guy with the camera. That, to me, suggests that the VR is so good that he wants to take a picture of what he's looking at through his headset. And this, it doesn't always require high-end tech. This is something that some of you guys may be familiar with, silent disco, an environment that you go into to party with your pals, but as individuals 
listen to maybe one, two, or three channels. So it feels as though increasingly virtual reality and tech is pushing us further and further down a route where we're coming away from community. We're shrinking back into ourselves. So my contention is that actually virtual reality is just creating virtual solitary confinement. Sure, it's immersive, but we're withdrawing. We're creating our own individual worlds. Which is weird for me. I'm guessing none of this has ever happened to you. A bedroom scene. Bedrooms are for sleeping and for, well, certainly not spending time with your partner on a mobile phone. But this is happening. Again, no virtual reality headset in sight, but solitary confinement. Real immersion is created with high-tech devices. But actually, we're shrinking. We're shrinking back in to our own individual worlds. Now, what's happening is that people aren't doing things together anymore. We're losing what's called shared narrative. Sure, people talk about narrative all the time. What is narrative? It's about sharing stories. It's about coming together. It's about experiencing things together. Like this, it makes us feel closer. And actually, it helps build memory. And I would contend that actually, as we shrink in our virtual worlds, as we become immersed as individuals, we don't have those anchors that create memory. We're actually following a path, and we're highly entertained. We're certainly highly engaged. But actually, are we creating memories? Now, I have a teenage boy, and I'm sure many of you have. And you'll come back to me and say, hey, that's not true. Here's a virtual reality world. This is Fortnite, one of the most played games in the world right now. And actually, the people that are playing it are using voice over IP technology to chat with their pals, to collaborate, to win games. So there is a collaborative element. They are having a shared moment. Perhaps there is shared narrative. But there's no physicality. And because there's no physicality, there are no anchors. And because there are no anchors, there are very little, there is very little memory of these types of events. And if you don't believe me, I would ask you to contrast it with something that I bet most of you do remember, which is this. Spectacular sight in the end. I was particularly pleased that worked because I worked for the company that built the cauldron. Uh, we should have been watching it through our fingers like that, but it worked. And it drew together not only the people in the stadium, but the entire world. There were almost a billion people watching this on broadcast. A billion people. That's a lot of people. And what they had was an anchor, an anchor to build memory, a memory of something that hopefully would stay with them forever. So what I'm trying to say here is that actually, to create memory, you need a moment. And actually, you need a moment that has two things. It has something tangible something physical. It doesn't have to be virtual. And it has to be social as well. And I would ask you to put your phones down here. This isn't about social media. It's social in respect of coming together, being part of something bigger. And I'm lucky enough to be in a business which does this all the time. And we get asked to create scenery and engineering for stadium-sized gigs, opening ceremonies, spectaculars, that sort of thing. And actually, what we're doing is creating anchors, anchors that allow people to create memory. This, for example, is a 42-meter icebreaker that we used at the opening ceremony of the Paralympics in Sochi 2014. We built it from polycarbonate, gave it a scenic treatment, and then put it in a shipping container and sent it to Sochi. We created the hull out of a giant inner tube from a bicycle. We gave it scenic treatment, we put it in a container, and we sent it to Sochi. In fact, the first time it had ever been together, 
was when we got it to Sochi in Russia. It was huge. It was too big to be built as a single item in our workshops. And our workshops, incidentally, are just eight miles down the road from here. And this provided an anchor. It provided a moment that people would remember forever. Another example. Hands up who's been to Turkmenistan. One. That's the most I've ever had. <laughs> Turkmenistan is an interesting place. Uh, it's hot as Hades, and it has an interesting political environment. As part of their growth, they're a very rich oil and gas nation, and they want to raise their profile as a country able to host an Olympic Games. They hosted last year the Asian Indoor and Martial Arts Games, and we were invited to take part uh, to create elements for the opening ceremony. This chap is called Ogus Han. He's a character of fable and legend, and there's a 20-meter statue of Ogus in downtown Ashgabat. The anchor for the ceremony was a big reveal of this hero, the legendary hero of Ashgabat. So we replicated him. We scanned him, we crafted him out of polystyrene, we gave him a dress, and we set him under stage at the National Stadium over in Turkmenistan. He looked awesome. He was the moment that people would remember forever. An interesting coda to this particular story was it got so hot in Ashgabat, it was regularly north of 50 degrees, that the polystyrene from which he made his face has started to melt. I got a frantic phone call suggesting, his face is melting, what are we going to do? So we put him in the shade and we Botoxed him. <laughs> he looked about 20 years younger when we'd finished. It doesn't always work and we don't always remember it for the right reasons. Here is a snowflake which resolves into an Olympic ring. We had five of these. They were things of beauty. They weren't to work like that in the ceremony. That was just a mandrolic test. But we strung them up from cranes in our yard. We added LED. We filled them with pyrotechnics and they worked beautifully. They worked beautiful, beautifully in Tokwith down the road and they worked beautifully in rehearsal. What didn't work so beautifully was at ceremony time. This was a moment that people remembered forever. At that moment, I was wishing I was living in a virtual reality, but we're not. And things happen and people remember this because they are anchored. They are anchored in physicality. So, actually, you need a crowd, you need social, you need get-together, you need objects. But actually, is this always true? Well, virtual reality is one thing, and augmented reality is another. We were commissioned in 2015 to build the UK pavilion for the Milan Expo, and the notion there was health of the planet and sustainability. The winning designer, Wolfgang Buttress, focused on the humble honeybee, and he crafted the design for a giant beehive. And we took this design and we built it out of 169,300 parts of aluminium. I like the parallel in that shot of workers and the worker bees in the previous slide. The neat thing about this was it was connected to a real beehive in Nottingham. And the real beehive had an accelerometer in it. And when the bees were about to swarm, it would send a signal over the wire and the thousand LEDs inside the internal sphere would light up. That was reality. Those were real bees in a real beehive in Nottingham but we were augmenting that by displaying the data in interesting ways, creating more moments for people to remember forever. It came back from Milan, and it's now in Kew. So this is the hive structure in Kew Gardens, and you'll see the LED flickering around it, creating moments as individuals that we could remember forever. And whilst we're on an animal theme, in the last six weeks, we created a fifth line for Trafalgar Square. We sculpted him from high-density polyurethane foam. Um, following a LIDAR scan of the real lines, uh, we created a fake plinth, and we painted him red. This was a collaboration with Ez Devlin, the designer, and Google Deep Learning Labs. And we put them together with the other four lines. The augmented reality piece was interesting here in that Google had spent lots of time building algorithms to collate poetry, uh, scanned poetry from the last two or three centuries, which combined to work out how poetry should actually be created just by the structure and the syntax of the words. 
Individuals could submit a word of their own, and it would create a poem based around that and project it up Nelson's column. Here was yet more augmented reality. There was an interaction. This wasn't a real line, but it was using real data to create a moment that people would remember forever. And the final example I'll share with you is from earlier this year in Pyeongchang, South Korea, at the opening of the Winter Olympics. We created uh, a steel wire catenary above the field of play, uh, and it was awkward. This is Stig and Stu, our riggers, who are up there rigging in temperatures of minus 40 degrees. The holy grail was to try and keep your gloves on. Some of those bolts were tricksy, and you had to take your gloves off, and the guys were freezing. These were real heroes, but they were creating environments that people would remember forever. So they created a dome, and we worked with creatives to, to perform a light show, uh, which formed the very basis of the entire opening and closing ceremonies. It looked great when you were there at opening, but actually for those watching on TV, there was an augmented element too. All of the dome that you could see over the field of play wasn't real. It was all done in post-production. And there was all sorts of clever tech to try and recreate this TV view inside of the stadium too. It was interesting when I came back from South Korea, all my technical friends would say, how on earth did you do the dome? And they had no idea it wasn't real. It was augmented. So, I'd like to contend that augmentation actually beats virtual reality. It gives a better, a richer experience. And actually, it helps us create real-world moments, which create memories, which help us make feel better about the whole creative experience. So let's return to the original contention. What if this is all virtual reality? What if this is all about high-end software running on high-end hardware? Are we not really here at all? What would this mean for memory? What would this mean for anchors? What would this mean for anything at all? Well, actually, if this is a simulation, if none of this is real, then perhaps these anchors are necessary. Maybe we desire them because they're needed, because they help us feel that this isn't, in fact, a reality. I'll leave you with this hopefully something that you will all remember forever. Thank you.